Okay, going live in three, two, one. And we are live. Hello, Melanie Phillips. How are you today? Hello, Abby. From London, where the sun is shining and the weather is a distinct improvement on the national mood. Okay, I guess we're going to hear all about that in a few minutes. Uh, it actually uh, was drizzling a little on Friday, and there was like storms down in a lot on Friday as well. So starting right. to feel a, a, a little bit of your uh, British <laughs> wetness here in the Holy Land. It would take quite a lot for you to feel anything remotely resembling the particular shade of grey that is London's normal uh, temperature. Got it. Yes, I'll, I'll stick with the Israeli weather. Well, it is a pleasure having you again to be able to hear your insight. And why don't we start off with Britain? Uh, just last week, a, a horrible incident of two Jewish women assaulted at a, uh, a pro-Corbyn event. What, what insight can you give us from, uh, from London? Well, I only know what I've read, uh, which is very horrible, uh, which is that there was a meeting uh, held uh, in North London, uh, I think last Tuesday evening, uh, a meeting by, uh, as I understand it, Momentum, which is the far left faction that has captured the Labour Party, um, the Socialist Workers Party, the extreme uh, revolutionary communist uh, cell, and the PSC, the Palestine Solidarity Committee. And what appears to have happened was that uh, these, uh, these groups uh, were uh, trying to, um, uh, they're, they're, according to them, trying to build unity in the face of the great row over anti-Semitism uh, and in the wake of um, a call by Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who posted a tweet uh, last Monday uh, afternoon or uh, earlier in the week. Um, blaming the Conservative Party for, quote, the politics of division and for creating a, quote, toxic, hostile environment. Now, the toxic, hostile environment was on display at this meeting of his own momentum uh, group um, and the uh, Palestine Solidarity people, because what seems to have happened is that two women who I know slightly, um, uh, Sharon Claff and Ambrosine Shitreet, uh, tried to enter the meeting as Jewish protesters against Labour Party and left-wing anti-Semitism often do, to try to protest, to take notes, to film, uh, to monitor, to make their voice heard uh, on behalf of Israel against the calumnies being mounted against it. And what happened was they were attacked. Um, I'm not quite sure of the precise details, but they were attacked, as I understand it, outside the meeting. Sharon Claff was allegedly kicked in the head and certainly sustained injuries bad enough for her to be taken to hospital. Um, they're not life threatening, as I understand it, but they were not unserious. And uh, this is a particularly shocking event. The two women involved um, are not young. Um, and what's even more shocking than the events that have that actually took place that evening um, is the almost total absence of any serious uh, attention given to this or condemnation on social media. Um, there has been a great deal of blaming the victim going on, that these two women are being accused of being uh, certainly extreme, uh, uh, abusive, um, right wing as if any of that explains or condones or, or justifies uh, thuggery. And I'm afraid that is now a pattern of events, this kind of intimidation and violence against people who seek to make their voice heard on behalf of Israel, uh, on behalf of truth and justice uh, towards Israel, uh, against anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and on the left. And those people are being manhandled regularly out of meetings. They're being identified sinisterly, sometimes uh, by uh, uh, facial recognition because they are known to the organizers as people who go around uh, protesting. But more sinisterly than that, uh, some, on, 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 on one or two occasions at least, uh, it would appear they've been singled out because they look Jewish or because they have Jewish sounding names and they're flung out. 
Um, and this is becoming kind of the norm in the Corbyn Labour Party. And, you know, this is particularly directed at Jews or Jewish protesters over the anti-Semitism issue. But I believe that this is the pattern that Corbyn's Labour Party is going to show towards anybody who dissents. I mean, there's anecdotal evidence now uh, beginning to mount of the same kind of action being taken against non-Jews who are seeking to protest or uh, dissent from uh, the uh, momentum uh, style uh, uh, Labour Party. Um, and so I'm afraid this is the face of the future. What always what always uh, sort of shocks me is how it's always the left who call out fascism against the right. But yet, as we see, today's world is actually the left that is acting as the fascists. Am, am I wrong on that? Well, uh, I hesitate simply because fascism is a specific ideology and one can certainly be held up uh, for criticism by saying everything is fascist, that is an abuse of power, because fascism is a particular ideology. However, at the core of fascism is a gross abuse of power. It is a belief in violence rather than democratic means. Um, and uh, it is um, a, a, a cult around a leader. And I'm afraid Jeremy Corbyn is a bit of a cultish leader. Um, but uh, certainly the elements of fascism that are, you know, a totalitarian attempt to suppress uh, even thought, let alone freedom to speak, and an attempt to uh, 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 stifle all dissent by uh, intimidation and violence, insofar as those are fascist uh, characteristics, they are certainly on display uh, in today's Labour Party. And they've been on display on the far left uh, going back to whenever. You see, this idea that the left has, that they can't be uh, bad people because they are anti-fascist, is untrue. If you look at the origins of both fascism and communism, you can see that although they took very divergent forms, their roots were the same in the counter-enlightenment, or indeed the enlightenment in Europe, going back to the 18th century. You can trace back um, a, a whole train of thought, I would say going back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who believed that people had to be, quote, forced to be free. And there you have the paradox of so-called progressive liberalism, that you extol freedom, but you force people to be free. In other words, you define what freedom means, and then you force people by whatever means that you have to uh, agree uh, or go along with that particular interpretation. And that is the roots of dictatorship, of tyranny, of fascism, of communism, or, uh, it, it is common to the desire to extinguish freedom. And that's what we're seeing in the Labour Party, I'm afraid, now. Wow. All right. So jumping from Labour Party and, and very, these very sad events that we're seeing to another British ish, um, current issue, Brexit. I understand you're about to write something and uh, there's some kind of uh, um, ultimatum to, uh, upon May to do something quickly, a decision. What, what is going on? What is the latest with that? Well, it's kind of the latest stage of meltdown. I mean, every week we're told, you know, she's got, you know, N days to save her premiership. And today we're being told she's got 72 hours to save her premiership. Um, and it may well be this is the actual crunch. I mean, there's certainly the crunch, whether it's 72 hours or the week or the next fortnight, I wouldn't say. But now, broadly speaking, is the crunch. And this is the crunch that I and others always saw coming on the basis that Mrs. May's uh, incompetence, lack of leadership, um, and lack of uh, a principle over this issue uh, would be her undoing and the undoing of these negotiations. What you have is an impasse. What we have in Britain is an impasse in which the European Union has laid down its red lines. I mean, I won't go into the tedious detail at the moment more than I have to, because it is rather tedious and we've all lost the will to live by trying to follow this detail. But broadly, the European Union negotiators have laid down their red lines. Mrs. May has laid down what appeared to be her red lines, but turned out not to be her red lines at all, because her real red line is her uh, determination to avoid at all costs what's called a no deal. 
That is to say, Britain walking away without making a deal with the European Union of any kind. Now, this has been represented by uh, most commentators, most uh, informed opinion, as it were, and certainly by all Remainers, um, and not a few Brexiteers, as being walking off the edge of a cliff. In other words, a no deal would be a catastrophe for Britain because there's no deal. So, you know, planes will fall out of the sky. Um, uh, goods will be stopped at Dover. Uh, uh, and, the, you know, all the motorways will be snarled up with lorries backing up from here to kingdom come and that kind of thing. There'll be no medicines. I mean, you will run out of food. I mean, you can't, can't imagine the, the scare stories. That's considered to be a no deal. Um, and as a result, because Mrs. May has made it clear to the European Union negotiators that she can't have no deal, she's given them the weapon against her uh, because they can say, look, we're saying this. You don't want it. Then it's no deal. And they know they've got her. So it's dawning on members of the Conservative government and Conservative Party and certainly many Brexiteers that no deal is not such a terrible thing at all. No deal simply means Britain walks away without a deal. And that's not good. Nobody would want that. But it's better than a bad deal because a no deal, no deal would mean that Britain is free, free to make its own agreements with everybody, free of all the restrictions that have prevented Britain from realising its tremendous potential as a great country able to make a tremendous economic case for itself and destroy the economic opposition, including the European Union, which is why they can't bear that fact and why they're doing everything to stop it. Furthermore, no deal does not mean catastrophe because everyone's forgotten that if it's bad for Britain, it's worse for the EU. The EU has no interest whatsoever. It's not in its interests for its own exports to be prevented from coming to Britain. The balance of trade is in Britain's favour. EU exports more to Britain than Britain exports to it. Not to say that the EU isn't a very important export market, but they stand to lose more than Britain does. They stand to lose a great deal if their planes can't fly into Heathrow Airport, and so on and so on. In other words, uh, if push comes to shove, Britain will get down with the member states of the European Union and with the European Union itself and do bilateral deals about this and that. Now, it's obvious to me, and it's been obvious since the start uh, to Brexiteers, that you can't disentangle a relationship as important and close as Britain's membership of the European Union without some pain. The British people have to take some pain. But in my view, the Brexiteer vote was driven by the belief that short-term pain was worth it because of the long-term gain. And that's what a true leader should be saying to the British people. Right. But she hasn't. Mrs May hasn't. So now she's stuck. And now the Brexiteers who went along with her on the basis that, well, she'd see us all right in the end. And she knows she can't go against the will of the British people to leave the European Union. And we can't bring her down because we can't think of a suitable replacement. And it would be terrible if we were accidentally to provoke a general election, which might bring in Jeremy Corbyn. All this led to a paralysis. And they've just gone along with her. And now they've reached kind of crunch point with the European Union. And now they are looking at her aghast because now they understand. Now they understand that she is being pushed into a bad deal which will tie up Britain forever. And so they are now facing the thing they didn't want to face, the need to get rid of her fast. And in my view, and I've said this many times to you, and I've written it many times on my website, she should never have become prime minister. She should never have stayed prime minister. She should never have been let within a million miles of this negotiation. She must be got rid of. And in my view, my final point is this. Britain, in my view, does not need at this point a prime minister. Britain doesn't have a functioning government. It's not doing anything other than Brexit. What Britain needs, and I speak as a convinced Brexiteer, at this point in time is one thing only, a leader who will lead the United Kingdom out of the European Union. It needs a caretaker leader. Once Britain's out safely of the European Union, everything else is to be discussed. Then they can start fighting over who should be the prime minister. But let's get the country out in the way that the majority of the British people in that 2016 referendum voted to do. 
Well, I, I hope she's listening to you today, Melanie. Maybe Something she'll listen. Something tells me she's not. <laughs> you can always hope. You can't give up on hope. But um, uh, all right, let's let us let's see what happens. But I definitely hear you. Now let's go on to the other issue. Um, this has taken up a lot of news, a lot of news space, especially in the Western media. The uh, Washington Post journalist, Ha Shog Ji, who was murdered... And uh, from what I understand, the, the, the skew of the media um, attention up until now is very different with some of the information you're about to shed some light on or that you've been writing about. So can you share with us? Uh, yes, I wrote a, a, a blog post a couple of days ago. Uh, not a blog post. I, I wrote a piece for the Jewish News Syndicate, uh, uh, which uh, um, uh, I wrote a couple of days ago, uh, based on information I was given, uh, which... Uh, puts what's happened to Mr. Khashoggi in a rather different light. First of all, I don't call him a journalist. I call him a Saudi exile. That's what he was or is. Let's assume he's dead. Let's call him what he was. Um, because Mr. Khashoggi, as I understand it, uh, and there have been some reports in the mainstream media acknowledging this fact, was very closely allied to the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and remained closely allied. He went back and forth, my understanding is. He, 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 he blew hot and cold. But basically, he was one of their uh, supporters. He's a, he's a, he was an Islamist. And his beef with the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, was not, as has been reported in the mainstream media, that he was opposed to MBS, as the crown prince is called, uh, because MBS wasn't going, going far and fast enough down the path of true modernization, liberalization, and democracy. Oh, no, no, no. Mr. Khashoggi believed that MBS was betraying Islamism by going in the wrong direction. He wanted to bring in democratic reforms, Mr. Khashoggi, uh, in order to elect, basically, Islamists, in order that Saudi should you know, continue down the true path of Islam. So Khashoggi was not a friend of the West at all. And indeed, he was closely allied with Turkey and with Qatar. He was about to start a center in Turkey funded by both uh, Turkey and Qatar. And his fiancée, uh, my understanding is that she is a Turkish uh, foreign, uh, a, a Turkish diplomat working for the Foreign Service. And her father was an advisor to uh, uh, Turkey's uh, Islamist and very dangerous demagogic uh, president, Erdogan. And uh, Khashoggi uh, had recently been tweeting messages or tweeting himself with um, pictures of himself with uh, advisors to Erdogan. In other words, he was associating himself with Erdogan Islamism. Now, the point about Khashoggi, as I was told, is that for 20 odd years, he was a really quite highly placed operative or asset, asset really, uh, for the Saudi intelligence service. And when he became, uh, so, so, and he, he, he left Saudi Arabia uh, in order to speak his mind. And the Saudi intelligence people thought that was okay. Uh, but when he became so close to Turkey, to Erdogan and to Qatar, and when he started to become a kind of pro-Erdogan activist, they got the wind up. The Saudis got the wind up and they decided they had to bring him back to Riyadh. They offered him a bribe of $9 million to come back to Riyadh, and he refused. They offered him bribes, apparently, repeatedly. He refused. And so, in desperation, uh, the MBS regime did something extremely stupid. They decided to kidnap him and bring him back to Riyadh for interrogation. They believed that he was giving secrets, uh, Saudi secrets, to Qatar, um, and they wanted to interrogate him, and then they would lock him up, probably for years. Not good. Not good, but they didn't set out to kill him. My informant said to me, if they wanted to kill him, it would have been very, very easy. You hire a gang of Chechen assassins in Istanbul. You pay them $200,000. You get him killed. It's passed off as a traffic accident. Nobody gives it a second thought. That's what they would have done had they wanted him killed. You don't send a squad of 15 men to kill somebody. You send a squad of 15 men to kidnap somebody. And so that's what they did, according to my sources. And they, uh, part of that squad was a doctor, uh, a pathologist. Uh, he apparently accompanies this, this kind of squad on this kind of mission all the time. Um, not very nice, but that's what they do. And the point of his presence was to sedate Khashoggi 
and to keep him sedated until he got back to Riyadh. But my informants tell me something went badly wrong. Uh, they think that the sedative gun misfired and overdosed him. And as a result, he suffocated. He was a 60-year-old man. He was overweight. His body couldn't cope with it. This is where it becomes the realm of speculation. And my sources have no idea what happened to his body after that. So all these lurid stories we've been getting about him being you know, dismembered by a bone saw while he was alive and so on, um, there is no evidence for that. And these stories have all come out of Turkish and Qatari sources, which are hardly uh, uh, objective sources. Now, I don't know whether my, my sources are correct. I have no way of checking this. But I do know that they are very, very, very well placed and well connected. And um, elements of their story do sound more plausible uh, than the lurid stories we've been hearing. Whatever the actual story, Khashoggi has disappeared. We have to presume that he is dead. We have to presume that he was killed in some way as a result of his going into the Saudi consulate. It is therefore a diplomatic disaster uh, for the MBS regime and a sign of MBS's uh, character flaws. Uh, at the very least, one can see from this episode that the kind of criticisms leveled at him are true, that he's impetuous, he's impulsive, he has very poor judgment, uh, he is very arrogant. Um, and uh, all these things are probably, you know, un un uncontestable, inc incontestable. However, however, if one takes the view that therefore he's unfit to lead Saudi Arabia and that the West must say we'll have nothing to do with this man, what's the West saying? That it would prefer Saudi Arabia to be run again by geriatrics committed to spread Wahhabism to the rest of the world as they have been doing. I mean, whatever his flaws, it seems to me, MBS is still remains the one hope of the West that you can turn the region to a set of policies which are more conducive to the West. Um, Saudi Arabia under MBS has been um, in tacit alliance with Israel and America against Iran. Many of the people who are uh, speaking against MBS so, 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 so intemperately as a result of this uh, episode, this debacle over Khashoggi, many of those people are avid supporters of the terrible uh, uh, nuclear deal with Iran, which would give Iran the bomb, which has funded Iran, which has enabled Iran to receive funds to uh, ac accelerate its heinous demand, its heinous uh, policies uh, uh, in the region and elsewhere. So, uh, you know, this is a very imperfect world. The entire Middle East, apart from Israel, is run by despots and tyrannies and terrible people who do terrible things to their dissidents, who lock them up and kill them uh, all the time. Iran does exactly that. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, one has to make a very, very hard decision. Do you, t you know, if you take a purist view and you say we can't deal with MBS because he's done this terrible thing to Khashoggi. Well, what about all the other dictators that the West deals with regularly? China, for example, which regularly disappears its, um, its dissidents. Uh, all kinds of, of regimes which regularly torture, uh, jail, torture and uh, uh, kill. Uh, dissidents and uh, oppress women and gay people and all the rest of it. So the hypocrisy is total. Um, and um, it's a difficult situation because, you know, the, M the, the Saudis have come up with some cock and bull story uh, as of the last day or so that, you know, they admit now that Khashoggi was killed in the embassy, in, in the consulate, but that it was a result of a fist fight, a brawl in which he got involved. Well, I mean, nobody believes this. So they've still if they're still digging themselves into a hole. And in my view, that is because the truth is one that they cannot admit to uh, because the truth is very unpleasant. The, kind, the, the story I've been told is one that they couldn't easily admit to. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But we, for sure, we haven't heard the true story of this yet uh, in, official, uh, in, in, in what's been said in official terms. And for sure, it is a crisis uh, over uh, the relationship of Saudi Arabia and America in particular, and we've yet to see how that will resolve. So I, I want to put the actual case of what happened to him, whether uh, what disappeared, murdered. Let's put that aside for a second. We don't know that. But, but the information that comes from your, what you're saying is so disturb should be so disturbing to freedom-loving people in the West, because here what we're hearing 
is that the Washington Post employed either a Saudi Arabian plant or a straight out Islamist and marketed him as a journalist, one. And two, he actually was an Islamist supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. And the story that the Western media today is pushing is one that's the exact opposite of what, in essence, might be the truth. They're pushing that he w w was supporting ref liberal reforms, where in essence he was supporting no more Islamism and a pro-Muslim Brotherhood direction together with Turkey and Qatar. And, and, it's, and it's disturbing that that's not giving attention yet. Well, I think there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is the unfortunate proclivity of people on the left to love people who are Islamists and to ignore the fact they are Islamists. And to be honest, I mean, there are many reasons for that, but I can't quite get to the bottom of that. Um, it's like a willful blindness um, that if somebody comes along and, 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 and poses as um, uh, a voice of reason in the Muslim world, uh, the media accept that person on face value and don't do any digging. I mean, one of the people who's been popping up on TV and on other media uh, in the wake of the Khashoggi disappearance, uh, who says, you know, he was a great friend of Khashoggi and uh, is protesting at his disappearance, um, is a man called Azam Tamimi. Uh, Azam Tamimi, uh, uh, I know from Britain from many years, he is a, the, the principal apologist for Hamas. Uh, uh, whether he is Hamas or not must remain uh, un, unstated. Uh, but certainly he's a one can say without cert, without any fear of contradiction. I've been up against him in a television, in a radio studio on several occasions uh, and television studio. Uh, he is an unashamed apologist for the Hamas and for what he would call the Hamas resistance against Israel. Now, the point about Azam Tamimi is that he was used over many years completely uncritically by the BBC and others. Um, and presented um, as simply um, uh, a Muslim who was speaking up um, and, you know, had various official handles, all of which were quite benign sounding. I don't know how he was, I can't remember recall how he was, specifically how he was presented on this occasion, but there he was again. So the left in the media and elsewhere does have this unfortunate uh, uh, ability to um, uh, accept these people on face value. But I think there's something more behind this than that, which is in a way even more disturbing, which is that for the West, and we saw this with the Arab Spring, the West cannot get it into its head that this is not a binary choice that everyone faces between, on the one hand, democracy, on the other hand, uh, Islamic tyranny. Um, when the Arab Spring happened, people thought it was tremendously wonderful turning point in the world because all these Arabs were leaping up and down for democracy. And what they didn't understand was that some of them were leaping up and down for democracy as we understand it, but many of them were leaping up and down for democratic elections to bring to power Islamist regimes to snuff out democracy. In other words, um, when people in the Islamic world resist Islamic oppression, and the Islamic oppression is true and real. These are real Islamic dictatorships, which are really uh, jailing, torturing, and murdering people in great number. That is absolutely correct. They're terrible regimes. But some of the people, many of the people resisting those regimes wants to install different terrible regimes where they too will extinguish freedom, life, and liberty. And people in the West don't understand this, that we're dealing with religious wars here. Uh, we're not dealing with democracy versus tyranny. We're dealing with religious tyranny versus religious tyranny in some cases. And I think that's the point about Khashoggi, perhaps, that, you know, he came from Saudi Arabia. He was unable to speak his mind in Saudi Arabia. That much, I think, is unarguably true. And consequently, uh, you can imagine how liberal Western journalists would embrace him as somebody who just wants to speak up um, and of course, you know, we in the West give him the freedom to speak up. And that's what we all want. We all want the same thing. We all want freedom to speak up. And so he becomes a journalist on the, Jeru on the, on the Jerusalem Post, on the Washington Post. But he's not a journalist at all. 
he's an activist. He's a Saudi exile who is given the platform on the Washington Post to speak his mind. But he becomes seen as a Western Washington Post journalist. And consequently, he's become accepted axiomatically as liberal. And I don't know, I never knew the man, but um, he appears to have been very affable and very personable. And he appears to have worked the system, worked, worked the circuits, the social circuits in the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and to have made you know, a number of, of friends and so on, and to be accepted as part of that world. It's very easy to do if you are fighting the tyranny of Saudi Arabian uh, repression, because it is a tyranny. It is repressive. You know? It doesn't mean, however, that everybody who opposes it is a good guy. Right. And it's interesting because, again, we were we were talking about uh, a, a disappointment in the understanding in the West and uh, and you were just focusing on the left. One thing that I believe is uh, is very dangerous for the left, especially when they call when they scream at Islamophobia, Islamophobia, they are ignoring the fact, as you pointed out, the biggest victims of Islam are Muslims. So when leftists call out Islamophobia and therefore ignore and take no action against the violence and intolerance that is within Islam, they're not just letting Jews, Christians, infidels be uh, further oppressed and persecuted. They're allowing Muslims to be further persecuted much more than the rest of us. Absolutely right. I think I'm right in saying that the majority of individuals in the world who have been oppressed by Islamic uh, extremism and Islamic terrorism are Muslim. Um, and every time the West says this is nothing to do with Islam, they are betraying all those people. They are abandoning them. And not just abandoning the millions uh, who are the victims of this in the Muslim world, but they are abandoning even more wickedly and stupidly, in my view, they are abandoning those Muslim reformers because there are Muslim reformers um, I don't mean ex-Muslims, I mean Muslims, practicing Muslims, who nevertheless understand that their religion has taken a turn for the heinous worse, and who believe that it can and should be reformed. Now, I have no idea whether it can be reformed. I'm not an Islamic scholar. Um, I believe it's difficult to reform Islam because of its core doctrines. But who am I to say that these reformers are not telling the truth, are not uh, realistic? For sure, whether or not they're realistic, we should be supporting them. But by saying this has got nothing to do with Islam and by pretending it's, you know, it's our fault in some way for oppressing them, uh, for, for oppressing the, the Muslim world, we in the West have abandoned these reformers. We've cut off their, we've cut off, we've cut them off at the knees virtually. And, you know, you can see this also in Iran. Um, uh, maybe not so much now because, you know, President Trump has, gone on record several times as, it, as, as, as supporting the Iranian people against their regime. But, you know, in Iran, um, there are millions of, of Iranians who, um, are, uh, who want to get rid of the regime which oppresses them so much um, and who have not been supported by the West. And indeed, under the uh, regime, under the, uh, under the, the, the administration of uh, President Obama, uh, uh, those people were actively betrayed because under President Obama, the Iran deal was done, the nuclear deal, which uh, poured in money to enable the Iranian regime to continue to accelerate its power grab in the region and over its own people and gave it the diplomatic cachet that it needed in the world. Instead, it should have been regarded as a complete pariah. It should have been starved of resources and all the rest of it, as President Trump is trying to do. So... I think the West has betrayed them. I mean, I, I, I'm not falling. I, I'm not making. I'm not saying that the Iranians are all Muslims. They are not. But in general, uh, the Islamic world has been betrayed by the West, which has abandoned it to its oppressors by pretending that uh, they are not oppressing it in the name of Islam. Well, I certainly wish uh, some decision makers are listening to you and reading your stuff because your insight is so critical and so important for anyone who really cares about the future freedom of, uh, of our lives. So, Melanie, thank you so much for your insight once again. Thank you, Avi. I wish that were true, too. Um, and thank you to everybody once again for watching and listening. Anyone who has not yet signed up for Melanie's newsletter, please go to MelaniePhillips.com. 
sign up for her newsletter, get all the insight right to your inbox when she writes it. I hope you enjoy listening and reading uh, her fabulous insight as much as I do. Melanie, it should be a, a wonderful, safe and healthy week. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, I should say before we sign off for uh, people who are interested, I shall be hopefully attending next Sunday's uh, conference in New York uh, on the subject of Jews and conservatism. I'm not sure whether there are any tickets left, but that's where I shall be. And maybe when we meet again, Abby, we can talk about what happened there. Looking forward very much so. Take care, Melanie, and thank you everyone for watching.